The Subcommittee on State Foreign Operations and Related Programs will come to order. Administrator Green, thank you for joining us today. I really do want to thank you for your stewardship of USA during very difficult times and for the dedication of our development professionals. USAID helps the world. Do you need a Kleenex? <laughs> We're all carrying them around. <laughs> USAID helps the world's most vulnerable assists in recovery from natural disasters and humanitarian crises, and supports countries' efforts to strengthen governance, rule of law, and human rights. This isn't just the right thing to do. It strengthens our national security and advances American interests. And you certainly have your work cut out for you. There are more than 70 million refugees and displaced people around the world, which is fueled by conflict, natural disasters, and climate change. Ebola continues to simmer in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo while the novel coronavirus outbreak threatens to become a pandemic. Despite significant progress, on our development priorities, we are currently off track to meet the UN's Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Our development and humanitarian efforts are our best hope to tackle these issues. This is why Congress has disregarded this administration's last three budget requests, instead providing sufficient resources to effectively and efficiently fund some of our most critical foreign policy priorities. The administration's fiscal year 2021 budget request includes funding for several development initiatives that we support, such as women's economic empowerment, investments to strengthen emerging private sectors, and global health security. However, the administration cannot be successful in these initiatives if we under or defund the basics, which is exactly what the proposed 20% cut to our foreign assistance programs would do. For example, if enacted, this request would cut basic education by 66% and family planning by 59%. Now, the administration certainly cannot seriously believe that millions of women can achieve economic empowerment if they are unable to read, write, do math, or control the timing and number of children they have. Any benefit from an increase in global health security would surely be offset by the proposed 34% cut to all other global health programs. Instead of requesting funding and implementing policies to ensure USAID can be successful, the administration seems intent on putting every possible barrier in your way. This is certainly true of the expansion of the global gag rule, the Kemp-Kastin determination against UNFPA, and unfair stigmatization of multilaterals as wasteful and working against U.S. interests. The administration's multiple policy reviews have also led to program delays and suspension of assistance. The subcommittee has always believed that our national security is strongest when defense, diplomacy, and development are equally funded. Without robust funding for development and humanitarian programs, the U.S. will fail to maintain our position as a leader on the global stage. 
This will not only harm the world's most vulnerable, it puts US lives at risk, reduces our influence. We cannot and will not allow this to happen. So again, I want to thank you for testifying today. And I look forward to your discussion and our discussions. And before we move to your testimony, let me turn to Mr. Rogers, the ranking member who is committed to these issues and has worked very hard as a partner. Please go forward with your opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome, Mr. Ambassador. We appreciate your being here to discuss the budget and the spending plans and a review of the, uh, your work at the uh, agency. Let me start by once again acknowledging the good work that you are doing at USAID and the collaborative manner in which you uh, do it. These are not easy times um, to be engaged in international development. The challenging operating environments from insecurity continue to mount, as do the needs of those we aim to help. I salute your dedicated cadre of development professionals that too often are working in or near very dangerous circumstances. Your leadership and experience, especially having served as an ambassador and coincidentally in this body, uh, comes at a critical time because you are already keenly aware of the risks our foreign service officers face in carrying out their duties. In these uncertain times, I want you to know that I am grateful for your leadership at uh, USAID and you have my support for whatever that means. Turning to the matter at hand, the president's budget request for fiscal 21 uh, is nearly a 20% cut from the fiscal 020 budget, uh, enacted budget. I suspect this proposed cut will be handled in a manner similar to prior years. Uh, I look forward to working with the chairwoman uh, in the weeks ahead on a bill that provides more appropriate levels of funding to address the serious global challenges that we are confronted with this year. However, there are a few notable improvements in parts of the budget that deserve mention, including prioritized funding for the Indo-Pacific strategy, countering Chinese, Russian, and Iranian malign influence, and a focus on strengthened engagement with the private sector. I hope you will address these topics as we go along this morning, as well as how you see the role of USAID in Afghanistan as we enter this new chapter of our engagement there. I'm also interested to hear more about how USAID has and will respond to the uh, coronavirus outbreak. As you know, uh, we've been working hard on a supplemental appropriations bill to help in this regard, and I hope and trust we will pass that through the House uh, this week. Uh, I was chairman of the full committee uh, when we uh, worked on the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, and also when uh, Zika hit. Having shepherded the supplementals to address those outbreaks through the Congress, I knew when I became chair of this subcommittee uh, that I wanted to create a pot of funding that could be tapped quickly to address an emerging health threat abroad. That is how we ended up with the emergency reserve that you were able to draw from uh, in last week for your initial response. I'm sure that the months ahead will not be easy in combating this current outbreak, but I hope you will keep us informed. Let us know what we can do to help in this global uh, effort.
There are more priorities that I will uh, address when it comes time for questions. So in closing with this opening uh, statement, let me once again thank you and the men and women of USAID for your hard work and your commitment to uh, service. We thank you. I yield. Thank you. And I will be calling on members based on seniority of the members that were present when the hearing was called to order. I will alternate between majority and minority, and each member is asked to keep their questions to within five minutes per round. But first, Administrator Green will be happy to place your full testimony into the record. If you would like to proceed by summarizing your oral statement, that would be fine. But proceed as you wish, and I want to make sure you leave enough time to get to everyone's questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Ranking Member Rogers, and members of the subcommittee. I do welcome this opportunity to summarize my testimony, uh, but also to express my appreciation for your ongoing support, particularly for the men and women professionals of USAID all around the world. As, uh, as you've noted, uh, they're working often in very trying circumstances. The President's fiscal year 2021 budget requests approximately $19.6 billion for USAID. It's an effort to balance fiscal responsibility here at home with our leadership role and national security imperatives on the world stage. I'd like to begin by discussing some of the latest developments on a few of our more pressing issues, like the DRC, where USAID continues to lead the U.S. government's response to the old Ebola outbreak. There is solid progress to report. There were no new confirmed cases last week, the first time that's happened since the response began. To be clear, the outbreak is not over. Ongoing security threats could still unravel the progress, but nonetheless, there is reason to be optimistic. Of course, one of the administration's very highest priorities is taking on the threat posed by the coronavirus. Last month, Secretary Pompeo announced that the U.S. government will contribute up to $100 million to help stem the spread of the disease internationally. That includes $37 million, as uh, was referenced, from USAID for work in affected countries. These resources are at work in a range of activities, including surveillance, lab testing, and public messaging campaigns. We're also sending out personal protective equipment to a number of countries. There's still much we don't know about the disease, but it's worth noting that USAID has invested more than $1.1 billion in global health security since 2009. Those investments have helped improve the capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to emerging disease threats like the coronavirus. Uh, from natural crises to man-made crises, there's Yemen, in many ways the world's largest humanitarian disaster. Interference by the Houthis has forced us to plan for a partial suspension of programs in the country's north. They're harassing aid workers and imposing numerous obstacles to service delivery. We cannot tolerate our assistance being impeded or diverted. The Houthis must take action to end the interference or else we'll be forced to limit where and what we provide. In northwest Syria, recent operations by Syrian and Russian security forces have displaced nearly one million people from Idlib and Aleppo. A recent Security Council decision means, in effect, that UN agencies can no longer use one of the only three entry points into northeastern Syria, dangerously constricting a humanitarian lifeline. On a brighter note, last October, USAID signed its first bilateral agreement with Venezuela in decades. It enables us to expand our support to independent media, civil society, the National Assembly, and the government of Interim President Juan Guaido. It will also allow us to provide additional support once a democratic transition occurs. The request for Venezuela includes $205 million from ESDF and global health funds for that important work. We are all hopeful that we get to that day when such funds can be expended and invested. On a related note, I want to thank the subcommittee for its support of our work in Colombia. The visit by your staff to our mission was deeply appreciated by our teams there. In the Sahel, security conditions continue to deteriorate. 
The UN estimates in Burkina Faso, for example, 4,000 people have been displaced every single day since the year began. USAID is providing humanitarian assistance to those in need, trying to help stabilize violence-affected areas, and also counter extremist messaging. I want to take a moment and highlight two successes as we talk about some of the challenges. There are uh, great opportunities and progress that we can report on. In India, we hope to soon welcome the establishment of a new U.S.-India Development Foundation that will enable us to serve in a more catalytic role and help the government more effectively mobilize domestic resources towards areas of ongoing need. In Albania, there's similar progress. Prime Minister Edi Rama told me last November, Albania doesn't need more money. It needs more technical assistance and knowledge as it takes on corruption. We hope to soon see a U.S.-Albania Transparency Academy, which will help foster a culture of transparency and accountability in the country's governing institutions. Our ongoing work to bring transformation to the agency is becoming more tangible than ever. With your support, we've now legally established the Bureaus for Resilience and Food Security, Humanitarian Assistance, and Conflict Prevention and Stabilization. We hope they'll soon be joined by the proposed Bureau for Policy, Resources, and Performance, the concept note for which is still waiting congressional concurrence. It's the most important remaining piece of our transformation, and I look forward to continuing to work with you to answer any questions that you might have. Religious freedom isn't merely an American value, as we all know. It's a human right. Sadly, religious plurality and the freedom to openly practice one's faith remains under threat in many countries. We're continuing to support communities in northern Iraq and across the Middle East as they recover from ISIS brutality. The request includes $150 million to maintain and expand that work. We'll use those resources to assist communities of all faiths that face discrimination or persecution wherever it occurs. We're also committed to helping countries struggling to provide high-quality education for their children and youth. Uh, Madam Chair, given your announced retirement plans, I wanted to take a moment to offer a note of admiration. Throughout your time in Congress, you've promoted the transformative power of education. You've also paid special attention to children living in conflict and crisis situations, and you've worked tirelessly to provide them with access to educational services. Your work has created tools and rallied resources that provide hope for a generation at great risk. You may be stepping away from Congress, not yet, but your legacy will live on through the millions of people whose lives you have lifted. It's only one of the reasons you will always be my favorite Jewish mother. <laughs> Members, I appreciate your support, your guidance, your counsel, and Madam Chair, again, it's been an honor to appear before you. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Um, uh, first of all, I appreciate your very kind words. As you know, I have felt this has been really an opportunity to serve and to do many good things, and it has really been a special opportunity for me to work with you. We are fortunate to have a person with your integrity, your commitment, your knowledge in this position, and there's still many more months left. We could do a lot of good things together, so thank you again for your kind words. Now, I have many concerns, <laughs> as does this committee. <laughs> So uh, much so, for the uh, efforts. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll begin with Afghanistan, because it's been 17 years, I believe. Isn't that correct? And I am very concerned that the recently signed peace agreement with the Taliban could undermine the more than $30 billion this subcommittee has provided since 2002, to help promote the rights of women and girls, strengthen institutions for good governments, and increase access to quality education. Now, under the peace agreement, can you share with us 
What is USAID's role? Will our programs continue? Will there be any significant changes to USAID programming or presence? I have a second part, but I'll let you respond to the first. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I can't tell you that I know all the terms of the peace agreement yet, and, and obviously we're at the front end of it. I think Secretary Pompeo is, has, uh, has put it very well. We're at the moment of opportunity for the people of Afghanistan and their leaders. What I can tell you from the USAID perspective is that in addition to uh, focusing on the conditions necessary for peace, and applying the lessons that we have learned from these years, we are dedicated to implementing uh, the goals in our, CD, our, our country strategy, including women's empowerment and educational opportunity, particularly higher education opportunity. As we have spoken many times, uh, the future of Afghanistan, the sustainable, bright future for Afghanistan, is dependent upon increasing the role of women in the economy, in community leadership, and obviously that's very hard to do if those educational opportunities go away. So we continue to be dedicated to those goals. Now, can you ensure us or assure us that the investments made to strengthen the rights of women and girls and increase access to education can be maintained. For example, the subcommittee has demonstrated strong bipartisan support for the American University in Afghanistan. Will our assistance to AUAF continue under the peace agreement? Uh, let me break that apart, if I can, into, into two pieces. Uh, first, in terms of overall the goals that we have shared on women's empowerment and educational opportunity, what I can guarantee for you is that we'll continue to pursue those goals. We can never guarantee the outcomes. We can guarantee the effort. With respect to AUAF, as uh, we have talked about before, uh, AUAF has uh, been operating under an extended cooperative agreement, uh, the terms of which uh, run out in May. However, they've been granted a no-cost extension, which takes them into the summer, and they have been invited to compete for competitive funding, uh, which is out there. Uh, it's procurement sensitive, and I'm not even sure of all those who have, um, have uh, applied but I can tell you that the goals uh, of higher educational opportunities remain as important to us today as they ever have been. I just wonder if the administration in um, orchestrating these peace agreement is consulting with you at all. Are they looking for any assurance that uh, there may be actions that have to be put in place to preserve the extraordinary progress that has been made. Have you been part of any kind of discussions? Uh, what I can tell you is that we have uh, staff who have been assisting uh, our special envoy. So um, we have certainly had the opportunity to express or, or to remind uh, diplomatic representatives of the work that we've all been doing. And I know in the brief conversations that I have had that there is very much the sense that the work that we have been performing over the years has made a difference and is worth continuing to pursue. What precisely it looks like in the months and years ahead, I don't know for certain. I do know that we're going to continue to pursue that same strategy and those same goals that we have been talking about for some time. Thank you very much. I look forward to continuing that dialogue. Um, I'd like further assurance that these programs will continue. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mother Nita. Uh, Columbia, our anchor, our best partner in the region, uh, a 
a secure and stable Colombia is vital to our own national security. In fact, uh, Presidents Trump and Duque uh, met just yesterday at the White House. But they need our help. There's no doubt about it. Uh, they're being swamped by uh, a mass exodus from uh, Venezuela, their neighbor. Uh, I'm told that uh, there are now four and a half million <coughs> Venezuelan refugees and migrants living abroad, including 1.7 million in Colombia alone. Uh, I reported 2,000 refugees crossing the border every day. Are those numbers accurate? Uh, as far as we know, those numbers are accurate, and they're projected to go to as high as 6 million by the end of this year. Well, the president is almost desperate, uh, Duque, in his request for help. Um, ongoing political, human rights, socioeconomic developments in Venezuela uh, compel growing numbers of children, women, men, to leave for neighboring countries within Latin America and the Caribbean. And of course, they share a very long border with Colombia. Uh, is there extra f help that we can get to them, uh, them to uh, deal with this growing problem? Um, Congressman Rogers, uh, I, I think you've put your finger on it uh, very well because it is two different things. So there is the support that we continue to provide for um, both Venezuelans who have, are residing in Colombia and have gone throughout the region, as well as support for the host communities as they deal with the, uh, the burden of those uh, migrants who have come over. But separately, it's also important for us to deal with Colombia as our close ally in their own development challenges. And so we have invested heavily in some programs that uh, I know President Duque is extraordinarily pleased with and very supportive of. For example, uh, he often points to a land titling project we did. I used to be a real estate attorney. Nobody ever thanked me for title work before. But the work that we have done in uh, a city of a million people in Colombia created the first ever fully titled, fully land-tenured community. And that creates tremendous opportunities for economic empowerment, particularly for marginalized communities, women. But uh, we're not only trying to help Colombia deal with the costs of those who have fled there from Venezuela, we're trying to help Colombia as our development partner and diplomatic partner strengthen their economy, bring about peace and reconciliation, bring governance to largely ungoverned rural areas. So it's important on both fronts, and it's work that we are absolutely dedicated to. And again, I want to thank the members of the committee for the great support that you've shown and the special attention your staff is, has traveled down to Colombia uh, met with Colombians as well as some of the Venezuelans who have, have fled over, and we really appreciate the support and counsel. Well, the president, uh, Colombian President uh, Duque, says the very uh, existence of the region is at stake here. Is, is he overstating the problem? The, I think it is one of the most under-appreciated um, challenges in our hemisphere. When we talk about the challenges of displaced communities, uh, I think most Americans think of the far corners of the world. But this is our neighborhood, and you're exactly right. The Venezuelans who have fled four and a half million plus on their way to six, uh, many have gone through Colombia. They're not just going to Colombia, they're going to many other countries, Peru and Ecuador, and in some cases up to the Caribbean. It imposes tremendous costs, and it has an impact upon provision of social services, uh, access to education, uh, food security, and economic growth. 
So it's very important that we continue to focus on this region, both on the humanitarian side, but also looking for ways to build some resilience in these communities, because at this point, we don't see that, um, that tide, if you will, of, of forced migrants slowing down. It is two, three, three to 5,000 per day at some points, and those are uh, enormous costs and have real impact, so we, we need to focus on both. Thank you. Mr. Price. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning. Mr. Green, glad to see you. I appreciate your being here today. Uh, and I want to start by, <clears throat> by remarking that uh, I feel we're in a particular position to appreciate your good work, to value your good work on our bipartisan House Democracy Partnership. <clears throat> Our mission is to work collaboratively to strengthen parliamentary institutions in developing democracies, as, as you very well know. We simply could not do what we do without the National Democratic Institute, the International Republican Institute. They're funded directly, of course, through the National Endowment for Democracy, but they're often funded in the countries we're working with through grants and cooperative agreements with USAID. When we're in these countries, we also, of course, see broader evidence of your, of your, of your good work and your engagement, uh, the contributions you make to almost all of our 24 uh, partner countries. And as you might expect, we may have some specific ideas about the treatment of these countries in your budgets, and we'll be wanting to uh, work with you uh, on that. We do look out for these countries, and we value their transition to democracy and sometimes how fragile it can be. Speaking of which, I, I want to ask you about Central America. When a country is in bad shape where citizens are fleeing for their lives, it seems that it would be in our national interest to um, try to address the root causes of this out-migration and to fund programs, often through your agency, that uh, seek to do that. But that isn't what we've seen in this administration. Since March uh, 2019, this uh, administration has cut or withheld almost all foreign assistance, including humanitarian assistance, to the Northern Triangle countries. That would be El Salvador, um, Honduras, and, and Guatemala, despite Congress continuing to appropriate this funding. So obviously one issue is the merits of the case. The other is, uh, is a contravening a congressional intent. It's my understanding that of the $1.66 billion Congress has appropriated to this region since fiscal 2018, the administration has invested only 200 to 300 million, often accompanied, as I'm, I'm afraid we're all aware, by the president's uh, punitive rhetoric. So I want to ask you about that. Uh, there have been, over the years, a lot of advocates, bipartisan, all over the ideological spectrum, most famously, I suppose, General Kelly, when he was uh, commander of Southcom. There have been a lot of advocates for this kind of, uh, this kind of support for these countries this kind of home country support to address the conditions that, uh, that often prompt uh, out-migration. So I want to ask you about that, of course, but I also want to ask you to take a few steps back, and maybe this will help us understand what's going on here. What, what would you say more generally about the potential of foreign assistance in, in, in these situations? Um, foreign aid can do some things, other things it cannot do. Uh, humanitarian development and economic assistance, what, what is the potential in Central America or anywhere else to address the root causes of people fleeing the country, out migration. Uh, so, so we're concerned about these cuts. I'm very concerned about these cuts, but also concerned about the general proposition that, uh, that we're, uh, we're over, overlooking a, uh, a potential that foreign assistance gives us to deal with a critical uh, international issue. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what I'd invite you to reflect on. <clears throat> thank you, Congressman. Uh, very quickly on HDP, uh, thank you. I think that the HDP uh, partnership is a very important one. I will say very quickly, just to plant the seed, we have a number of countries that are uh, emerging into democracy, and they often uh, lack a couple of things that we sometimes assume are there. Number one, transparency. They may not have an experience in transparency, and I think we can help strengthen that uh, much to their, to their benefit. 
But secondly, separation of powers. And you and I have spoken about this. There's not enough investment made in legislative oversight. Uh, state USAID, we tend to deal with the chief executive, the executive branch. I'm a big fan of HDP because it's an important program in that area. Secondly, when it comes to uh, the displacement challenges, there are a couple of parts to it. Uh, number one is root causes, you're correct. And we've been working um, while we're in this pause for our development assistance into the Northern Triangle <laughs> to develop uh, methods for better calibrating the geographic sources from which out-migration is coming so that when we're able to get back uh, to full work, when the administration is satisfied that we have strong and willing partners in our host country governments, uh, that we can better focus some of those programs. But the other piece that you're focusing on uh, or, or that you're pointing to, I think is the challenge that's perhaps um, not addressed enough by all of us. I don't know that we've got all the answers. So as um, Chairwoman Lowy pointed out so well I, in the opening comment she made, we have about 71 million displaced people in the world and we have a generation that's growing up displaced, either in camps or in, in displaced villages. And I truly worry about their connectivity to the world around them. So we have to look at such things, obviously, as nutrition and, and health, education, and how we provide education in these uh, disparate settings, but also, more broadly, connectivity. How do we help young people connect to the world around them so that as they grow up, they're ready to contribute to a more stable, peaceful, prosperous world? It's a daunting challenge, and I, I can't tell you I've got all the answers, but it is what is causing all of us to think a, a great deal and reflect upon what tools can be developed. So you're right. We've got, not just in the Northern Triangle, but in many places of the world, a couple of sets of challenges addressing the root causes that often drive people, um, uh, which is often insecurity, lack of opportunity, uh, oppression, conflict, but also those who are in motion. How do we help them so that we aren't locked into cycles where people are, are become um, vulnerable to the worst kinds of exploitative forces in the years ahead? So that's something that's causing us to think a, a great deal and reflect, and we look forward to working with you on it, because I think it is a daunting generational challenge for us. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Fortenberry. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this important hearing. Administrator Green, Congressman Green, Ambassador Green, I never know what to call you, but welcome to the hearing. Thank you for, obviously, what is a long, distinguished career in public service. And I think you have one of the best jobs in government. It's tough, it's difficult, sometimes it's hard to explain because there's a, honestly a lot of fragmentation, but there's a lot of variation to the types of problems that, that we have. The United States continues to lead the world in terms of humanitarian relief and frankly charitable generosity and you're at the point of that, so I'm grateful for that. I, I wanna point something out to you. I wrote to the General Accountability Office uh, coming up on about a year ago and asked them to basically do a a mapping strategy for all the food security and assistance programs that America has, that we're engaged with in terms of multinational organizations, as well as um, touching upon the myriad of non-governmental organizations that touch this space. As, as you're quite aware, food security is the foundation for stabilization as well as human flourishing. So I'd like you to address that question, how well food security through our myriad of important programs, whether that's Feed the Future, uh, Food for Peace, uh, the, the variety of other outreach efforts that you have through uh, the micro types of programs that are out there, are being fully inter integrated, socialized as, again, that foundational piece, piece of your work. So that's just a broad comment. Second, and I'd like you to comment on it, but secondly, the same thing goes with uh, conservation and biodiversity. As we're moving forward in this century, emphasizing the need for environmental security is absolutely critical. Holistic approach that includes persons and things uh, in place-based strategy is absolutely essential in my mind to your work. Again, please address how well we're doing. There's a new idea floating out there 
that is tactile, as reals, individuals and communities can embrace it, it's the planting of trees as a way to stop deforestation, again, provide stabilization for biodiversity, and, and address the issue of carbon in the atmosphere. And finally, I, if we have time, I want to talk, talk to you a little bit about northern Iraq and your efforts there. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, any one of the topics you've raised, I think, might be the topic for a good uh, hearing unto itself. Uh, first off, on food security, it allows me to point out that uh, on this subcommittee and at USAID, we have the great privilege of working in an area in which every administration in modern times has created important tools. And Feed the Future, uh, which was created during the Obama administration, is a marvelous tool that we're all very excited about. We have continued to prioritize investments in food security through Feed the Future, but the global water strategy as well, nutrition priority countries and resilience focused countries, all of those tools uh, come together. In terms of, of how we're thinking about it, in the transformation process, we have legally launched a new Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, recognizing that food security uh, is not simply a matter of providing foodstuffs. It is also building some of the resilience to help communities withstand future shock. Plus, on top of it, the greatest opportunities in most parts of the world for economic growth, for uh, surging economically, are in the food security area. If you don't get food security right, it's very, very difficult to grow very far and to provide opportunities for your young people. So uh, in the transformation process, we're elevating it and making sure that resilience goes along with food security. Uh, conservation and biodiversity, uh, you and I share a great passion. We're, uh, I'm a big supporter of the CARPE program, which is our longest and largest biodiversity program, as well as the Delta program. But I, I, not only is it important for the goal of pursuing biodiversity in and of itself, which we elevate in our metrics, but I also want to point out that those efforts at combating wildlife trafficking are particularly important right now. If you look at where in recent years the most dangerous infectious outbreaks come from, almost all of it has some linkage to zoonotic causes. So uh, tackling wildlife trafficking is not only a good conservation measure, it's a good health measure, and it's increasingly important. So again, it's going to be ele elevated and prioritized in our work going forward because it's also a matter of health security. Ms. Ms. Frankel. Thank you. Th thank you. Mr. Green, for being here. I, 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 I want to add my compliment to your organization. I've traveled all over the world. I've met with many of your workers and the NGOs that you fund, and I just, uh, I add the compliment. So Thank don't you. Take my, my, my job is usually to get out of their way, quite yeah. frankly. They're talented. So don't take my questions personally today. Uh, I, I want to, first, I, I think I'll start with a story, and then I want to ask you a question relative to that, because I actually had a visitor to my office uh, a couple months ago, and she, her name was, uh, doesn't matter what her name is, Celeste. She was 31 years old. She was a mother of two children uh, from Mozambique. And I'm not sure if I met her or somebody who knew her, but here's the story. She had lost her husband to AIDS in 2017 and turned to the Mozambique Association for Family Development for help when she discovered she had HIV positive. She was HIV positive. Uh, the, the clinic set a routine for her, and she told me that uh, if it wasn't for these visits, she wouldn't be alive. However, there's a however to this. Uh, apparently, when there was a cut uh, from uh, this clinic's money because of the expanded gag rule, it shut down, and she, basically she had no place to go. So my, my first question, because I think people maybe don't understand this, and maybe you could explain it. 
I know that uh, federal money is not allowed to use for abortions, all right? So we're not going to argue that. I don't agree with that, but I'm not going to argue that today. In the past, other administrations, Republican administrations, have had what's uh, known as this gag rule, which would not permit a family plan. It would affect organizations that did family planning. My understanding is under the uh, Trump administration, with what I call its abortion obsession and its desire to placate the very extreme right wing of Americans who are obsessed with abortion, uh, that there, that uh, now the whole uh, gag rule is now applied to all health care money. And so that uh, it's not just in family planning, but also in health care. So if you could just explain that, if that's true, and what is the size of that amount of money that's being affected. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. So it does apply to basically all uh, health care funds. Um, but I think the important thing to remember is it doesn't reduce health care funding one dollar. So the overall funding that is provided in for our global health work is not reduced by the PLGHA. Well, okay, if I could, I could, well, it's not reduced. It is re attempting to be reduced here in your budget by a very significant amount, which I'm, I would hope you disagree, but I'm not going to put you on the spot. The fact of the matter is, I guess the question is, is there any data now that you have that indicates whether or not all these other, uh, all these NGOs or these clinics that have been defunded have been adequately replaced? Because I just gave you an example of a, a clinic in a small village that has been defunded, that was doing all the health care for the village. It's been defunded. Are there, have there been replacements? So let me answer that with a couple of, of points. So first off, you, you began by referencing PEPFAR and the important AIDS work that is yes. being done. Uh, some of that, obviously, I will defer to Ambassador Burks for. But I know that she has said publicly that under the budget request, all those who are on ARTs, uh, there's sufficient resources for that to continue. Secondly, on the question you're posing of all of the organizations for which PLGHA is applicable, uh, the vast majority have agreed to the conditions that are at the heart of PLGHA, and those that have not, uh, obviously, it is on us then to endeavor to make sure there is a smooth transition to the continued provision of those services. I know that uh, there is an overdue report to you and to this committee. It, it is overdue by a, a, a ways and it is in the interagency process. We will, as we've done before, make sure we report to you completely and accurately what the numbers are to help address your question. All right, I, I, I would, are we going to have a second round of questions? Okay, thank you, and I, I'll yield back. I'll, I'll, I'll ask my other questions later. Ms. Roby. Good morning. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Administrator Green, uh, for your testimony before our committee today. And I know that um, the chairman already asked about Afghanistan, but um, it's very, very important to me as well. And throughout my time in Congress, as you know, um, I've had the opportunity to visit Afghanistan eight times and looking forward to my ninth trip coming up. Um, the time that I've spent in Afghanistan has been truly impactful for me, both um, as a member of Congress, but personally. Um, and the purpose of our trip, of course, is to spend time with our troops. And um, we usually um, try to schedule this trip in and around Mother's Day to be uh, with our female troops on that special day who are away from their families. But we also have the unique opportunity to spend time with Afghan people and especially Afghan women um, in various regions throughout the country. And um, whereas, again, I know this has already been brought up in terms of um, um, the AUAF, but um, as we look towards... Um, peace in Afghanistan, and we hope for, of course, a conflict-free future. The path forward needs to be thoughtful and methodical. We cannot 
we cannot lose uh, the gains that we've made, especially as it pertains to women's rights. So I'm going to give you yet another opportunity um, as it relates to USAID. Uh, what does the future of humanitarian aid uh, to Afghanistan look like? And, and, and so not to repeat the questions that have already been asked, but looking at a long-term strategy um, towards ensuring stability in that region. And again, um, I think probably the best word that we can use as it relates to these incredible gains that have been made is that they are very fragile. And so um, I'll let you address that. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman, and, and uh, thank you for the attention that you've paid and, and, uh, and your travels. Um, you know, I think that uh, Secretary Pompeo has put it pretty well. There are challenges, obviously, even with the signing of the peace deal. Progress has been made. Right now, we have a real opportunity, and we have to call upon the Afghans to seize the opportunity, obviously. Uh, more specifically to your questions, humanitarian assistance, we will continue to provide humanitarian assistance. I think we all recognize that humanitarian assistance is treatment, not cure. So we're all hopeful for the day where it's not necessary. It's necessary right now, and we'll continue to provide that as, uh, as we can. More importantly is the development assistance in, in helping uh, uh, secure, lock in the tremendous progress that has been made in terms of women's empowerment, economic empowerment, but involvement in communities and educational opportunities. That's something that's very important to us, and we will continue to work in that area. We've also been working in the region to help secure MOUs to try to build some regional energy markets. There are real possibilities there. It's very hard for a country like Afghanistan to, to really seize its future w with the limited um, uh, electrification and energy that uh, connectivity that's there. So that's something that's important to us as well. But we all want to see uh, success, and we all want to build on the progress that's been made. And last year, you gave us an overview of the current um, transformation project being undertaken at USAID. And I understand one component of the transformation process would be to reevaluate how a country's socioeconomic um, pro progress is measured. So as it relates to Afghanistan or anywhere else, what are the markers that would be used to determine a country's success? In other words, what kind of metrics is USAID, and you've heard me, we've talked about this one-on-one -on -one before, um, uh, used to make future funding decisions? And I think that's really important, particularly as it relates to outcomes, not just inputs. Right. You know, we can talk all day here about what we're doing and what we're investing, but I think it's very important for us as we speak back to our constituents to be able to talk about outputs. And my time is running out, and maybe I'll save this for round two. If, if you want to just um, put that in your back pocket, and I'll, re I'll revisit this in the next round. Thank you. Ms. Ming. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, Mr. Ranking Member, uh, for holding this hearing. And thank you to Administrator Green for being here and for your work. Um, there are currently more people who have been forcibly displaced than any other time in our history, 70.8 million, according to UNHCR. At least a whole generation of children have been born and will live their formative years in refugee camps. In light of this, I am particularly concerned to once again see that the president's budget includes plans to decouple refugee programming from the diplomatic efforts of the State Department by transitioning almost all MRA money to the International Humanitarian Assistance Bureau, even though this was expressly forbidden in fiscal year 20 SFOPS appropriations. Um, two questions. Uh, one, how do you envision the balance between the diplomatic and developmental roles required in U.S. engagement on uh, these refugee issues, and two, what is your ideal breakdown between PRM and a future IHA when it comes to the use of the MRA money? So uh, in places all around the world, we work hand in glove with the State Department. 
um, there really isn't a, an issue. We each have roles to play. We each have capacities to play. Obviously, state has the diplomatic lead, and it should. And in each place where we work, uh, the chief of mission is, is obviously State Department. And so the, the goal, I think, for all of us is to make sure that there is integration, that it's seamless, that there isn't duplication. Our role is operational. Our role is to not only move money but to measure results and to make sure that we are nimble enough for changing needs. So I don't really see um, uh, an issue. It has worked. Um, uh, it has worked quite well, and we continue to work on uh, better integration. I'll, I'll let you pose some of this to the State Department, but I think both sides right now are, are comfortable with the approach that we are taking to make sure that there isn't either a seam or an overlap. Uh, you know, the, I think the challenge is increasingly that what we're seeing are communities in motion, and sometimes the distinction between internally displaced persons and refugees is a relatively artificial one, and it's a moving target. And so I think what we're both state and aid are trying to do is to make sure that we are appropriately postured for the terribly complicated nature of these, these quickly emerging challenges. Uh, so that's, that's sort of how we view it. Are, are there any risks to doing this? Are there, um, we were told during the rollout of the budget that there are plans to co-plan or co-locate the departments? We are co-located in most places, so I don't, I guess I'm, I'm not sure that I see either an issue or a, a risk. Again, um, we have, both have roles to play. And, uh, you know, we're not in places without State Department approval, and we fall under chief of mission authority. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up a little bit. We started talking about youth. Um, whether here in the U.S. or abroad, young people have long been at the forefront of building peace in their communities by creating youth-led movements, organizations, networks to mitigate negative effects of conflict and to prevent recurring cycles of violence. Uh, inclusive peace processes are, off, are proven to more holistically address the root causes of violence and lead to more sustainable peace. Especially in countries in conflict, it'll be the young people who bear the burden of sustaining the peace over generations. Um, what kind of outreach is USA doing to ensure that organizations led by and serve young people are engaged in conflict prevention strategies? I think you put your finger on a really important topic uh, and challenge and opportunity. So I've just returned from a visit to Tunisia. Uh, my second time there personally, I was there in, in a previous capacity. But as we know, it was young people in Tunisia that essentially led to the crafting of the most progressive constitution in the Arab world. And so I took the opportunity to meet with youth representatives several years later and say, okay, what do you think and where are you? And it was great to see that uh, they had not lost their dedication and enthusiasm. Uh, they saw that there were some practical challenges um, that needed to be worked on. My money's on them because that energy, I think, will carry Tunisia forward. But it's that kind of involvement that I think is a good model for many places in the world. Uh, for most of the displaced challenges that we're talking about, you're dead on. I mean, it, it's young people who we have to point to for the future. They're the ones that if, if we fail to provide them with tools and experience, we'll be locked into cycles and we won't get to where we need to be. So uh, I think you're, you're, it's very important. Finally, something else that I don't think gets perhaps enough attention is we talk about the challenges that we see from the Chinese model, for example, of uh, development and assistance. I worry a great deal that young people may not even realize that their future is being mortgaged in terms of debt distress, but oftentimes loss of natural resources and biodiversity. So it's important that we involve young people up front early on 
so that they get to help realize their birthright and, and claim that future that you're pointing to. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. Um, we're going to begin a second round, and we'll continue as long as you're gracious enough to give us your time. Thank you. I'd like to continue on the Mexico City issue. It was February 2018 that the, administrated, uh, the administration indicated that its six months assessment was, it was too early to determine the policy's impact and that a complete report would be provided by December. I'm still waiting for that assessment. Meanwhile, the administration has issued clarifications, quote, to the policy that make it even more problematic for overseas partners. So first of all, when can I expect this assess in assessment? And in June 2019, the Lancet published a study on previous implementations of the global gag rule and found that abortions went up by 40% in countries dependent on USAID health programming, while contraceptive use went down 12%. So, how can the United States continue to implement a policy without knowing its effect? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first off, you are overdue for that uh, assessment. The um, six-month report that you pointed to, because it um, caught many uh, programs or projects midstream. That's why uh, we all felt it was too early to fully understand the impact of uh, the new policy. The next report is overdue, and it's in the interagency, and I will do my best to get it to you as soon as uh, we have it available. Uh, you're, you're certainly do that. With respect to the second part of your question, and the administration is, is confident that we can continue to meet our global health goals uh, at the same time that we prevent taxpayer money from directly or indirectly supporting organizations that perform or actively promote uh, abortion as a method of family planning. And um, the, uh, again, the, the report is due to you, but it hasn't reduced dollars and um, as far as I know, we have not had material disruptions in services, but again, that report is due to you. I know you're carrying out the policy, and you probably didn't make the policy, but do you think those who did are aware that abortions have gone up 40 percent? I'm afraid I, I can't answer as to what they, they might be aware of. Thank you. Um, Let's talk a minute about the coronavirus. We're all closely watching the global spread of coronavirus. Disease outbreaks are becoming more frequent. The committee has tried to partner with the administration to ensure that there are funding and flexible authorities to robustly respond. Can you share with us uh, what role, if any, USAID is currently playing in the coronavirus response, and how have USAID, USAID investments better prepared countries to respond to such disease threats, and where do gaps remain? Uh, thank you for the question. So as a, a general matter over the years, uh, we have made a range of investments that I think have built the capacity for surveillance detection and processing in many parts of the world. In particular, I would point to the university networks that we've invested in uh, that help on animal surveillance. As, as we've discussed, uh, one of the great challenges that we're seeing is how many of these dangerous infectious diseases are zoonotic in origin. So they're, they're emerging from uh, trafficked wildlife. Uh, and so that's something that's of, of attention or of uh, concern to us. But I do think as a general matter, the investments that we've all made have uh, built the capacity to detect and to treat. I also think the public uh, messaging networks that have been created are important. It, we oftentimes 
underappreciate how important those are. We see it, for example, in the Ebola setting. So much of what we need to do in uh, interventions and uh, in the case of coronavirus, uh, God willing, eventually a vaccine, require clear messaging to the public so that they're coming forward or that they take the appropriate precautions. Part of what we've invested in is that, making sure that we have those networks that are set up. Uh, you can see, I think, the success that we've had in the role that we've played in combating the Zika virus, in uh, H1N1 flu, West Africa Ebola, and knock on wood, the winding down of the current Ebola outbreak. But with the case of the coronavirus, there is obviously a great deal that we don't know. And as we see uh, outbreaks, large outbreaks occur outside of China, for example, in Iran, that creates obviously real challenges for all of us because it becomes a multipolar uh, outbreak source. And so we're working very hard to make sure that we are able to provide PPEs, but also boost the capacity of labs in various parts of the world so that we're better prepared. The other piece to it that I'm, you know, that we'll all be thinking about ho hopefully soon are the, the secondary implications. So uh, these outbreaks could destabilize health networks, health systems. Uh, we're concerned that they might uh, sort of set back development progress that's been made. The other area that we're concerned about uh, are the risks that some of the countries uh, where we know there is the outbreak are potentially underreporting and not living up to the international health regulations. Those are challenges for us. So um, in these early days, we know there are a number of challenges out there. We're working closely, particularly with the State Department, to make sure that um, our resources are applied to the challenge. But again, um, uh, there's a lot we don't know. The Trump administration, very obviously, uh, as we all know, the highest priority is protecting Americans here at home. And I think you can see that in the early steps that the administration has taken and the team that they have assembled. And we look forward to continuing to support uh, the work of the administration in this. Well, I'm glad to hear you're involved, Chris, if I'm not mistaken. In January 2019, when the task force was announced, it didn't include USAID or the Defense Department, which are the two primary players in the Ebola response in West Africa. So um, I think I'm, my time is almost up. But I'm glad from your remarks that you are being included in the discussion. Yeah, to be clear, we're not members of the White House Task Force, but we certainly— Is that a mistake? Uh, so we're not members of the White House Task Force, but, but I can tell you that we are contributing in the interagency and making sure that our assets are brought to bear. Well, does the White House understand when they create a task force, if they le leave a critical agency out of it, uh, or, you, or doesn't it make any difference? Are you still putting in your two cents? Uh, I would that? never say it doesn't make a difference. Uh, I will say that... Um, but you can correct them and say, ah, oh, you forgot so about me. Again, I, and we continue to... Um, two things. First off, it. ourselves. <laughs> we are organizing <laughs> ourselves and posturing ourselves so that we're better organized to be able to contribute. And secondly... Uh, we continue to provide information to uh, particularly the State Department and members of the task force. And we work pretty closely with uh, CDC anyway. I have regular phone calls with Dr. Redfield, so uh, the information flows are solid. They're good. Well, I'm delighted. Even though you weren't made a formal part, I'm glad they're taking advantage of your expertise. Thank you. Mr. Rogers. The uh, U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy, um, your efforts, our efforts uh, to improve market access, promote fair, free, and reciprocal trade, and help countries uh, resist coercive economic practices. <clears throat> uh, we've provided $2.9 billion from state and aid 
to Indo-Pacific uh, nations for development and economic growth since the start of the Trump administration. But on the other hand, there's China. Uh, over the uh, last 15 years, uh, China has fueled one of the most dramatic and geographically far-reaching surges in official peacetime lending in history. Uh, China's massive Belt and Road Initiative symbolizes uh, Beijing's new role as a provider of development and uh, export credits and development finance of all sorts, spanning roughly 80 countries. Uh, it can claim to cover more than two-thirds of the world's population. It could include Chinese investments approaching $1 trillion, seven times what the U.S. spent under the Marshall Plan, seven times. It intends to strengthen hard infrastructure with new road and railways, soft infrastructure with trade and transportation agreements, even cultural ties with university scholarships and other people-to-people -people exchanges. The most distinctive feature of the Belt and Road is its lack of transparency. Few outside the Chinese government and development agencies that do that lending and the governments and state-owned enterprises that do the borrowing know what the loan terms are. By limiting outside scrutiny, the initiative's lack of transparency will give Chinese companies an edge in risky markets and it allows Beijing to use large projects to exercise political influence. Um, a un-American type of program. Understanding that the U.S. response has to come from different agencies, lots of them. Uh, what is AID's role and your strategy to counter this China model? Great, uh, great question. So first, I think as a general matter, part of what we're trying to do is help uh, partner countries understand the bargain involved and the very different models that are out there. So the model that we offer our assistance partners is one of self-reliance. We want to help countries undertake the reforms and make the commitments that are necessary to become self-reliant. And that's what we offer at the end of that journey together. Uh, China and other authoritarians offer something very different. They want dependency. It was just the opposite of what it is that, that we offer. And so our job, part of it, is to make clear that distinction. Secondly, in more specific terms, we have some tools that, particularly in the uh, Indo-Pacific area, that we have provided to partner countries to help them objectively evaluate some of the deals that are being offered to them so that there is an objective understanding of the consequences. So it may be a, a, you know, a cash fix up front, but the long-term consequences in terms of uh, loss of assets and debt distress are significant. On top of that, uh, reference was made to the indicators that we use to help guide our investments and to also guide the diplomatic discussions that we have with our counterparts. In this year's um, what we call roadmaps, we have provided a debt distress indicator to help understand uh, how close a country is coming to what the World Bank would point to as significant debt distress and make sure that that is out on the table and in public for uh, the discussions that we have. Uh, further, USCID's role in all of this is to help take on the enabling environment. So what is it that stops American companies from investing in many of these countries? It's usually not capital. Capital is there. Capital is available. It's rule of law. It's regulatory predictability. It's the kind of transparency that you pointed to. So in the work that we do, we try to strengthen those um, aspects of governing institutions, very confident that if we're able to make those changes and reforms and strengthen that, 
uh, American business investment will take off, market-based investments will take off. And you know, we all know that market-based economics are the key to realizing the future for many of these countries. And so those are the reforms that we undertake. Finally, in terms of the Indo-Pacific itself, very specifically, we are increasing our presence. We're uh, adding U.S. direct hires. Uh, I'm planning on heading to Australia soon to do a development dialogue with our friends in Australia. We hope to have a senior development advisor there, which will help us as we coordinate investments and reforms in the Pacific Islands and in the region. So uh, we're increasing our presence, doubling down on our enabling environment work, and also hopefully doing a better job in helping partner countries understand the costs and the benefits of the various models. Thank you. Mr. Price. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Administrator, I want to first uh, uh, thank you for your answer to my uh, question in the first round, which had to do with uh, the, uh, the cutoff of, uh, of funds to uh, the Central American Triangle countries that are designed to, um, to, to address the forces uh, behind out-migration. Uh, I, I want to give you a chance to say anything more you want to say about that, but then I do want to turn to an, another, another issue. But I, uh, I do appreciate those reflections on the potential of foreign assistance to address the root causes of out-migration. Um, such aid is, is, of course, going to be limited. Even under the best of conditions, it will be limited, so it has to be targeted effectively. What I didn't hear you say, that it was helpful to cut it off completely, or almost completely, which is what the administration has done in Central America. That, that um, is, uh, it's hard to see how that is constructive or, or helpful. And it's also important, I think, to note how hard it's going to be to start it up again. I, um, I appreciate your anticipating that it will be started up again. But the implementers, mainly nonprofits, tell us that the cutoff has prompted distrust in affected communities. It's prompted a, an erosion of cooperative ties, and they're not going to be repaired overnight. So um, I appreciate your comments on the potential of such funding. And, uh, and I, I am bound to observe that when you compare this funding to $13 billion being diverted from U.S. defense program to build a border wall. And that border wall does nothing to address with as asylum seekers who are, after all, turning themselves in. Uh, the, the, the money we're talking about for these home country efforts is, is uh, far less than 10% of that um, misbegotten uh, wall funding. Um, now, let me, let me turn to a critical country in our hemisphere that um, I'm sure we, we, we have um, a, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, discussion going on about what, what on earth we do about the current lack of Haiti's uh, functioning government in Haiti. Uh, what is the potential here? What, what is the ability of USAID and other donors to carry out programs in Haiti? If we take a sober look at what's happening there, uh, helping Haiti promote citizen responsive governance, including our work at HDP with the parliament. It's just not feasible in the current uh, impasse. Both houses of the parliament, with the, opposite, with the exception of a small fraction of the Senate, have, have in fact lost their mandates because there have not been uh, timely elections. So what's USAID doing to assess the problem, to fix the problem? Uh, no other country is uh, in a position to take the lead in this Haitian situation. Why? How do you assess the difficulties in, in, in governance, just basic uh, governance, holding timely elections, other such uh, functions, and uh, what, um, what's, what's your assessment of what we or anybody else can do about it? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, I've made a couple of trips to Haiti during my tenure uh, most recently, uh, just weeks ago, and it was uh, uh, obviously disturbing uh, to see the violence that was taking place, disrupting the ability for kids to go to school for weeks on end, 
the ability for uh, small businesses to get parts necessary to move forward. Um, yeah, deeply, deeply disturbing. So a, a few thoughts. First, the good news is there are a number of heroes in Haiti. Small organizations, many are faith-based, not necessarily all, but some of the hospitals that I've seen and small schools that I've seen, even under trying circumstances, creating opportunities. I want to do everything I can to ensure that resources are available to build on this work, because right now with the dysfunction in the government, it's the people, it's the everyday families that are suffering terribly, and I think we're all uh, deeply worried about a lost generation in, in Haiti. Uh, secondly, there are seeds for hope. I visited a small um, banana farm, if you will, uh, where I they were doing some mechanization, but there was a wonderful cooperative in which they were training um, everyday Haitians to take on all the aspects of upgrading the operation so that the fruit can be uh, exported into the international stream of commerce, which is the future to be able to export. Uh, the frustration of that day is, is they got ready to show me the operation of the farm and only one of the lines was working because the violence had disrupted the truck traffic necessary to get the parts for the other lines. And so I saw both the hope of the future and just the frustration of the present. I met with President Moise and I uh, expressed my uh, deep, deep concern about the dysfunction in the government. And, uh, uh, you know, in the short term, we're bound and determined to, to do some humanitarian assistance. Again, treatment, not cure. I can't promise you that we can always get humanitarian assistance everywhere we'd like to because of the security situation but we want to build upon some of these heroes I, I referred to. And finally, uh, I indicated to a number of people, I think the only way that you begin to restore people's faith in government there is you need some kind of special prosecutor on corruption. Until people see a couple of the big guys, using that term, behind bars for corruption, I think it's really hard for people to have a lot of faith in their government. And so we're looking at the opportunities about uh, in ways that we can play a constructive role in that. Uh, Haiti's our neighborhood. We're not going to give up. We refuse to give up. Haiti matters to us. It's a country of great interest, concern. There's so many linkages, but uh, it is challenging work to say the least. Uh, th thank you for those comments, and I couldn't agree more about the uh, corruption issue and how central that is to uh, to building trust. Uh, let me just say, uh, my time's expired, but I'll just make the comment that um, governance is basic to everything else. And uh, I, I remember very well urging on Secretary Clinton after the earthquake that uh, that attention be paid to the literal collapse of the uh, not just the buildings that house the government, but the the um, the near collapse of the government um, itself. And so, um, I think you'll have the support of this subcommittee as you uh, address that aspect, that critical aspect of uh, of what we all agree is a is a devastating uh, situation. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to take the privilege of the chair because I appreciate my colleagues' remarks regarding Haiti. Um, this has been an obsession of mine and most frustrating because we can't seem to do anything. Uh, I hate to say it, but when I look back and I was there, I think it was 19, at, at least 50, 60 years ago with Papa Doc. Uh, I hate to say that. At least people weren't getting killed on the street. Uh, I would really like to work with Mr. Price and my other colleagues with you. I recently met with the ambassador, um, Sissom, again. And before that, we've had other capable people from USAID, uh, from the State Department working on Haiti. We don't have terrorists yet. It's right here as a neighbor. It's the most frust Well, there are many things that are frustrating to me. I won't say it's the most, but it's among my top and I would like to work with you and Mr. Price and others 
to see, I'm not sure if it's money, focus, more people, but we've had the best people focus on Haiti and we can't seem to make a change. And people can't live. The crime is everywhere. Um, and yet, I had an experience where within a group um, where I was complaining about Haiti and one person raised their hand, I'm part of a group, a medical group in Haiti, and we're doing excellent things, so it's all not bad. But we understand the huge challenge, and I would like to say for myself, Mr. Price, and others who really are desperate to try and find some solutions that work, we'd like to work with you. And I'm not sure if it's money, money and focus. We've tried everything. So I just want to... Um, say I agree with you, my good friend, Mr. Price, and I know many of us feel the same way. Madam Chair, I'll, I'll just say that uh, the committee has been extraordinarily helpful. We've met with staff at bipartisan meetings with staff, actually before and after my recent trips, and I think there's broad bipartisan support looking for answers and willing to try most anything. We look forward to continuing that conversation. We all recognize how important this is. Thank you. Ms. Roby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'll go back to the question where I, we left off. So under the transformation plan, what are the markers that would be used to determine a country's success? In other words, what metrics will USAID use to make future funding decisions? Thank you. Uh, so what we try to measure are, and I think you put your finger on it, we're not measuring inputs. We're not even measuring outputs, we're measuring outcomes. We have 17 third-party metrics that we use that measure both a country's capacity in each of the key areas that, that we work and identified by our stakeholders, but also commitment. Because if our host country partners are not willing to put their own skin in the game and undertake reforms, then quite frankly, we're largely wasting our time. And so what we try to do is to plot where countries are. It's not perfect. There aren't perfect metrics out there, but try to use it to guide our discussions. Uh, in a perfect world, what we hope to do is to have our investments prioritized according to those metrics. I understand that there will always be superimposed uh, directives and priorities, whether it comes from the administration or comes from Congress, and that's simply the way the process works. None of those, however, is, is a, a problem in terms of the broad way that we proceed. The most important thing that we get from our metrics, not just how it guides our investments, but it guides our discussions. And what I found when you sit down with your host country partners and you have for lack of a better term, honest adult conversations and say, look, you know, we're not saying we get all the answers, but this is what we see and this is how we think we can be helpful. Um, in almost every case I'm aware of, the host country partners say, great, let's sit down and see what we can craft together. So we're interested in, in outcomes instead of outputs, not simply looking at the programs, but how they build the capacity of a country to eventually take these challenges on themselves. We add to it, uh, I think, a prioritizing of domestic resource mobilization, helping them more effectively and efficiently capture their own revenues. Again, it's their country. They need to put investments into these areas. Otherwise, they become, for lack of a better term, a dependent. And, no country wants to be that, nor should want to be that. So we're really trying to move in a direction in which our host country partners see us as honest friends walking along a journey with them. Thank you, and thank you for the work that you do. And Madam Chair, I yield back. Ms. Lee. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you um, for being here. Uh, good to see you. I apologize for being late, but we're across the hall uh, having a hearing on childhood poverty. And of course, I come from the state of California where unfortunately, uh, 
childhood poverty rates are the highest in the country, if you can believe that, from the golden state of California. My district's one of the highest. So it's a moral disgrace, and that's what we're uh, dealing with across the way. So thank you again. I apologize if these questions are redundant. But let me ask you, first of all, and I'll try to put all the questions together, the budget cuts in um, HIV AIDS funding through PEPFAR. You know this has been bipartisan. We're trying to achieve an AIDS-free generation by 2030, yet you've cut it by, I guess, 1.5 million below the um, 20 enacted amount. I don't know what in the world could be the justification for this, but I'd like to hear your answer on that. And also the Global Fund contributions. Uh, you know, our, we have a 33 percent um, limit in terms of our share, and now it's down in this budget to 25 percent. Of course, that's going to affect not only our contribution to the Global Fund, but to the operations throughout the world. Uh, secondly, I want to ask you about, uh, and we've talked a little bit about this, about Gambia. Uh, we were there with Congressman Price and our House Democratic Partnerships in the Gambia, and w we recognized that uh, they really have uh, a new government, great possibilities. They need USAID's presence, and we know there's a regional effort, but um, we talked to many people there, and I wanted, and we've talked a little bit about this, and I want to see some presence, some footprint of USAID in the Gambia. I think we have a real opportunity there, and I don't see anything in the budget uh, creating that, so I'd like you to talk a little bit about that uh, if we do move ahead to try to ensure a presence of USAID in the Gambia. And then let me just ask you about the administration's peace plan as it relates to UNRWA. You know, the um, United States and the administration ended all humanitarian and development assistance to the Palestinians last year. Uh, and we know, though, that um, UNRWA uh, had a 70-year U.S. relationship with the United States. But now, uh, but also we know that not one cent of UNRWA funding passes through the PA. Can you kind of explain what's going to take place now under this new peace plan and as it relates to Palestinian assistance, what's going to happen as it relates to the funding for schools and hospitals and humanitarian assistance? And does this administration intend to restore aid to the Palestinian people? So thank you very much. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, a lot of topics to cover. Uh, so on uh, PEPFAR and the Global Fund, uh, first, I, I think it's important to note that we remain the largest contributor to the global AIDS effort, as, as you know. In terms of the specifics on the PEPFAR front, uh, earlier I was asked a question, uh, and Ambassador Burks has indicated that under this budget, the resources are sufficient to continue all those who are on ARTs will continue to receive ARTs. Uh, beyond that, to be honest, I should defer to, to her as uh, the leader of the PEPFAR program. One area that I think is exciting, uh, that you and I both think is exciting, is the huge commitment we have now made to Gavi which I think provides some long-term answers on a number of uh, global health fronts. This is the largest ever multi-year commitment. We're very proud of that, and I, I think it's something that, that we can celebrate. Secondly, on the Gambia... But we shouldn't reduce it to 25 percent, because that's going to mean our leveraging ability for the global right, fund goes that's, down. Right, that, and that's separate from, from, from Gavi, yeah. uh, obviously. Um, on the Gambia, you and I have spoken. I share your uh, concerns, and so we are looking at that now. Uh, there are some potential restrictions because of trafficking in persons, and yeah. so it's something we're, we're looking at closely. And, and again, we have you and I have discussed it. I I can I share your your prioritizing uh, because we have uh, real hope in moving away from an authoritarian past. And uh, we certainly don't want to lose it. And if we do, things don't get better. We know things get worse. So that is something that we're we're looking okay, at. Okay, well, as this way. bill moves forward, I'd like to work with you and uh, our Chairman uh, Price and our Chairwoman to see what we can do in this bill as it relates to Gambia and USAID. Great. No, okay. no, most certainly. Okay, thank you. On uh, UNRWA, that's uh, uh, better addressed to the State Department. UNRWA is... A, is in uh, related to the State Department. On the peace plan, what I can say is in terms of our West Bank Gaza presence, we have no plans to close it. We're trying to continue 
uh, our presence there. Uh, the 45 local staff that are part of their presence are, are currently involved in helping USAID programs in, in other areas and other missions. And uh, we're hopeful for a day when uh, the work can resume as part of the peace plan. Okay. Thank you. Thank Mr. Fortenberry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My children's great, 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 great grandfather was Haitian. And uh, when I met with the Haitian president, I told him that, and he said, welcome home. Um, I miss the fullness of the discussion in this regard, but clearly it's important to a lot of members. Um, Haitian culture, Haitian history is so inextricably intertwined with America. I think there's 11 million ha Haitians, people of Haitian origin in the United States. Multiple school groups, church groups have connectedness to various projects there, and yet the problem is so vexing of governance, criminality, a lack of seemingly as sustainable economic dynamics. What, Ms. Madam Chair, if I could be presumptuous and suggest something, perhaps we should invite Ambassador, the excellent Ambassador Sisson here, and mm -hmm. Mr. Administrator, if you might be able to join in that conversation to just start unpacking layer by layer so that we have a huge amount of resources there. We've done so for a very long time. It, it, it just deserves more than three minutes here. Um, perhaps I can talk to the Chair afterward about that idea. Uh, I share uh, your uh, love of Haiti. You know, first off, one of the things that always moves me when I go to Haiti and you travel around and you see the buzz of activity. There's a joy on the, the street Haitian there. People. It's amazing. Very much so. Yeah. So the problem isn't with the Haitian people. Yeah. Uh, as I point out, um, it, it certainly Haiti has been struck by numerous natural disasters, as we all know. But when people protest, they're not protesting the hurricanes, right? They're protesting an entirely unresponsive government, a government that refuses to get itself in order to deliver even the most basic of services. A quick story, my last trip down there, I was uh, at a dinner with a number of Haitian business leaders, and in the middle of the dinner, one of the leaders got up and walked out, and then they leaned forward and said he had just gotten a phone call to say his brother-in-law had been kidnapped. I mean, that's just sort of the yeah. daily life that we're seeing there. And we cannot rest with that happening. I, I appreciate your comments, and I'm sorry to expedite along here, but um, the time's just so short. Uh, if the chair would consider my request, I'd be happy to talk to you afterward about that. I think some type of working group to get us beyond just the touch points in the hearing. In the last omnibus bill, by the way, there's some language that we got included uh, that tries to get you to look more seriously at the border crisis issue with the Dominican, which is one of the underlying factors of disruption of the economy. So let's let's put that on the side for another day. I want to return back to the food security piece and the, and the uh, General Accountability Office request that I made to look at this mapping strategy as to how our programs, the other uh, important food security programs across our government, the World Food Program, uh, can be possibly better integrated to ensure that we are a force multiplier to go to the heart of what this transformational idea is in terms of stabilization and human flourishing. So I want to get you a copy of that. I'd appreciate it if uh, Chair Lowy and Ranking Member Rogers would look at this as well. If I could include it in the record of this hearing, I'd, I'd be grateful, Madam Chair. Again, it's the letter that I sent to the Government Accountability it's Office. It's a pleasure without objection. Thank you, Madam Chair. And finally, let's turn to uh, the issue of northern Iraq quickly. We've been there together. Uh, in this past budget, not in report language, but in bill language, we, we were finally able to get uh, what you and I have talked about in terms of security, um, conceptually that the ethno, ethnic religious minority community ought to be integrated in the national security structures of the Iraqi government. Um, it's clear language. It's pointed to that. We are in dialogue with the Defense Department now. I want you to be aware of that. Can you give me an idea of where we are in terms of economic aid? And then as we move forward on the security component, which would be potentially implemented, obviously, in strong solidarity and partnership with the Iraqi government, but also by other um, international partners, um, how it could lead to sustainability for the hundreds of millions of dollars that we're spending there in terms of stabilization. Could I get your update on that, please? 
Great. Thank you, Congressman. And I do remember the trip we took together, and uh, your follow-up on the security front is deeply appreciated. As we've discussed then and, and recently, it's very hard for us to succeed in the goals that we have of, of creating an opportunity for uh, those in northern Iraq, religious and ethnic minorities, from Yazidis to Chaldean Catholics, to come back or to at least stay and see it as their home if we don't get security right. Uh, even in the challenging environment that we all see, there are investments coming in. And, and we've had some sessions recently on the ground in which we've seen investors come in. I just recently met with a business person who's looking to invest in a bottling and canning operation in the region. So uh, there are opportunities. There is interest. If the environment is secure, um, if the government realizes that these are not merely minorities but in in their terms, component communities, part of the whole, there's every reason to believe that this can recover some of that wonderful tradition and mosaic of ethnicities and faiths that has been something we all admire in northern Iraq. Ms. Frankel. Once again, thank you for your service. I uh, do want to uh, note that the administration has uh, paid some attention to uh, women's economic empowerment in regards to, there's a couple of pieces of legislation, uh, the WE Act, there's a new uh, Women's Global Development Prosperi Prosperity Initiative. But I just want to say that, you know, there's an old expression, don't cut off your nose to spite your face. Uh, it is all well and good that the administration would seek to change property laws in countries or find capital for women's businesses. But when you're cutting the budget to educate girls, there's 130 million girls in this world who are out of school. So this budget is asking to cut hundreds of millions from education. And the other thing is women have to be, and girls have to be healthy to be successful. Uh, this budget, proposes billions of dollars a cut to global health, uh, which gets me back to our initial discussion of the global gag rule, which I think I let you slip or slip or really slide by. Um, and I, I want to just read something so people understand what it is and how damaging it is, because it is more than just about, it's not really about federal funding of abortion. It's about keeping uh, girls and, and women from access to full health care and to, to uh, truthful information from the health care providers. The global gag rule is one of the most deeply damaging policies ever enacted on foreign assistance funding. The gag rule blocks U.S. federal funding for non-governmental organizations that provide abortion counseling or referrals advocate to decriminalize abortion or expand abortion service, services, even when those activities are funded independently of U.S. aid. Reinstated by President Trump sh shortly after he took office in 2017, the newly expanded version of the gag rule targets organizations working on any program funded by U.S. global health assistance, including programs that expand access to contraceptives reproductive health care, HIV testing, treatment and prevention, efforts to fight malaria, and public health programs working to improve child and maternal health outcomes. Uh, and this, uh, I will uh, agree with those who say, represents the most dangerous version of an already damaging legislation ever stated. And just to give an example, so that people are clear, we don't allow federal funding of abortions. That's another issue. But if you go into a clinic, like I mentioned before, in a small village in Mozambique, where people get their general health care, if, if a, a woman who is pregnant asks, even asks the question, uh, where can she get abortion, she is not allowed to be told that, or this clinic loses its funding. Even if there is, happens to be a pamphlet lying on a table that actually doesn't mention abortion, but actually mentions the name of another 
uh, health care uh, clinic or organization that actually gives abortion uh, referrals or does abortions, they lose their funding. So I, just, I want everyone to be clear about this obsession that is hurting millions and millions of women all over the world now. Uh, so I guess I can, uh, oh, I still, do I have time? I still have time. So I, I, I do, I'm gonna ask you a question. You don't have to defend this policy. I'm not asking you to do that. I don't think you can. Uh, but I do wanna ask you uh, about uh, the Women's Entrepreneurship and Economic Empowerment Act, which identified uh, key barriers to women's economic empowerment, including child marriage, female gen gender mutilation, access to education, gender-based violence. Unfortunately, did not mention health care, but that's for another day. Uh, could you just tell us whether or not, uh, given especially these suggested cuts, that you do you have the staffing and training needed to conduct the gender analysis that's required and to really get into the sort of the meat and potatoes of the legislation? Uh, good question, and uh, thanks for your great support of the gender uh, work that we're all um, talking about. So the President's National Security Strategy recognizes that gender empowerment, women's empowerment is a national security matter. And we feel as though we have, in the last couple of years, gotten some new exciting tools from the WE Act to WGDP to Women, Peace, and Security. And so we're excited about it. And just in the first year of WGDP, uh, 12 million women have been touched and new opportunities created. So we can always do more, but we believe we have the resources necessary to continue on with this work. And uh, we're excited to partner with you and to, to show you some of the early results, but to keep it going because it's, a, I think, one of those great bipartisan areas where um, there's a very bright future. And Madam Chair, I just, I, I want to just add one thing. If, if people, uh, a lot of people don't understand why we care on this committee and in Congress about health care in other parts of the world. And why would we care if somebody in a village has access to uh, health care. Why do we care if a woman has access to contraception? Because you know what? If there's no better example of how we are all interconnected is this coronavirus. And uh, when you look at uh, the spread of disease and the spread of terrorism, what we know, and it's pretty clear, which is why you're in the business you're in, and I thank you again, because I think this is such an important part of our government, is that when countries are more prosperous, when they are healthier, they are safer, and the world is safer. And with that, I hear the knocking of the paddle there, and I yield back. Thank you. And you will yield to Ms. Meng. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, last week, the GAO published a report on diversity at the State Department, which indicated that under multiple administrations, there has been a failure to ensure that our foreign and civil service reflects our country's diversity. Between 2002 and 2018, the proportion of racial or ethnic minorities working at state full-time has only increased by 4%, and those in the civil service decreased by 1%. This issue is exacerbated as members of the foreign and civil service rise in their careers. The report did not include USAID's workforce, but I wanted to ask a um, couple questions. One, can you tell us whether USAID's efforts toward a more diverse and inclusive workforce have made more progress than those at the State Department? Um, two, has USAID allocated funds to expand recruitment to minority communities and what types of um, steps are you taking to diversify? Uh, great question. Uh, so I have not read the GAO report, and I'm not going to comment on, on other agencies. What I will say is uh, uh, building a more diverse workforce and perhaps even more importantly, creating more career opportunities for that diverse workforce is a very high priority for me personally because I think part of the strength of our agency and American leadership is to project 
um, uh, leadership that reflects America, uh, and so it's a high priority. Our hallmark program for this is the Donald M. Payne uh, Development Fellowships, and I certainly would invite uh, members of the committee to accept Don, Fain, uh, Don Payne Fellows. Uh, they're always looking for opportunities, and we'd be very happy to work with you on that. But um, uh, on top of that, I, I will say that, um, and I think, Madam Chair, you, you know me well enough, I, I rarely, I don't like pointing to the past where things have been, um, where I've seen problems coming in. This is a problem I saw when I first arrived at USAID, and it's no one person or administration that goes back some years. Uh, we are doubling the number of people who are involved in administration of EEOC complaints to make sure that we, that everyone is comfortable. We have a respectful, inclusive workplace. Uh, we've tried to um, create new standards of employee conduct, and we've been training around that. Uh, we've tried to create a single point of entry for those who who feel as though there's been problems of a lack of inclusivity or harassment so that it's easier for people to come forward and report. It's a work in progress. But I, I will say when I arrived, it was an area in which I felt as though we were lacking. Not there yet, but I hope and believe that we're making some progress. Thank you. Um, different topic. Uh, according to UNICEF, roughly half the schools in low-income countries lack adequate drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene. Lack of privacy and sanitation results in inadequate menstrual hygiene and causes millions of girls to stay home from school each month. What are the advances the global community has made in the uh, area of menstrual hygiene and what more can be done by USAID and others to ensure that girls are able to simply attend school and stay in school? Uh, great question, and I know it's a particular concern of, of yours, and I appreciated that you've always uh, uh, raised the issue as something for us to, to look at closely. So um, uh, on one level, we now uh, endeavor to include in our humanitarian emergency response materials appropriate uh, menstrual hygiene um, uh, uh, materials, uh, because we know that's often lacking in those emergency situations. But more significantly, to your point, uh, you are right that um, a lack of uh, menstrual hygiene uh, materials and understanding is an important indicator of gender equity. And so we're working to create opportunities to approach the topic in schools in particular, I'm aware of a pilot program we undertook in Ghana that had significant outcomes in improving for young girls and women, not only improved self-worth and a sense of independence and in being able to pursue opportunities, but it actually, and perhaps more importantly, helped with young men in terms of image and outlook. And I think those are projects that should be expanded because I think, again, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to get at um, a full economic opportunity for young women if they're held back in this way. So you're right to raise it. It's something that we are trying to um, bolster because we think it makes a difference. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Ambassador, we uh, thank you for giving us plenty of time here today with you and thank you most importantly for the work that you're doing. We're trying to put together on the Hill um, a supplemental appropriations bill for the corona uh, matter. Uh, what do you need, in addition to your regular budget, what do you need besides that uh, to, to help fight this matter through? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, and I, my team will work with yours. I think one of the important things to recognize when it comes to the broad response is that 
uh, the coronavirus outbreak is going to create tremendous um, burdens on a number of healthcare systems. And so I think we need resources to help strengthen and replenish those. I think also um, we need to recognize that this is going to be a development setback in many countries. And so making sure that there are adequate resources to help um, bolster uh, the secondary impacts. I think also uh, the most obvious, additional resources to train healthcare workers to bolster the ability to test and diagnose for the coronavirus. I think additional resources to help on health facilities. And I think uh, in some ways, most importantly, resources to help convey clear, accurate information to the public. What we have seen with various outbreaks over the years and the coronavirus being the most challenging because it's global right now, covering obviously every continent but Antarctica, is combating some of the misinformation that's out there. We have seen um, some uh, powers, um, uh, such as Russia, quite frankly, put out lots of misinformation on the coronavirus in an effort to cause mischief. Whatever we can do to provide clear, accurate information on what it is and what it isn't, on the importance of coming forward, on um, making sure that people uh, have trust in their health care facilities. I think that's a really important part of the long-term solution on this. So there are a number of ways in, in which we believe we're part of the long-term answer. Well, we thank you for your testimony here today, and we wish you good luck. In conclusion, and I thank you for your last comment because it's a perfect segue to an issue which we haven't talked about this morning, uh, and that is USAID countering malign Kremlin influence framework. The Russian government, as you said, is pursuing efforts to undermine democracy, interfere with elections in the United States and in Europe, and fan the flames of nationalism in Europe. Last year, USAID rolled out its counter malign Kremlin influence development framework. I'd be interested to know something about it because I know almost nothing. Uh, how has the framework impacted USAID programming in the region and results to date? How is USAID supporting regional programs in Europe, including in Central Europe, to address disinformation and rising nationalism? How much funding does USAID devote to civil society and other regional programs in Central Europe? And once again, the administration is proposing significant cuts to bilateral development aid to countries like Ukraine, for which the administration proposes a 42% cut, Georgia, for which the administration proposes a 54% cut. So how can you explain to us and assert that the administration is serious in pushing back against Russia while proposing cuts to countries such as these that are on the front line of Russian aggression. I know the hour is late, but there has not been any discussion, and many of us are very, very concerned, especially with the elections coming up here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I've actually had a couple of trips to Europe uh, recently. I was at the Munich Security Conference and then prior to that, took my first trip to the Balkans and was in North Macedonia, Albania, uh, Kosovo, and Bulgaria. Uh, and in each of those areas, we spoke a great deal about the countering malign Kremlin influence framework. And so what we're trying to do uh, regionally and in some cases country by country is develop uh, economic independence so that they're less dependent upon, for example, uh, Moscow for energy sources. Also, in some cases like Ukraine, help strengthen their ability to protect against cyber attacks. Uh, in the region, a lot of our attention is now in bolstering transparency in government. 
one of the best ways that we can think of to counter these influences to create transparency so citizens are aware of influences and they are able to push back. Uh, I point to, for example, the U.S. Albania Transparency Academy that we're preparing to launch. We hope it'll be not only what the prime minister there has asked for in terms of a tool to fight corruption and malign influences, but perhaps even a model for the region. Another uh, tool that we're working on that I think holds great promise, we often talk about the importance of creating uh, independent, trustworthy media, and that is important. I think we need to go one step further uh, because the other side isn't playing by the media rules that you know we believe in. I think it's also media literacy, and it's helping citizens to recognize disinformation, misinformation, and um, uh, malign influences in the media process. That's something we're attempting to strengthen um, and, and will continue to build. So we have a lot of work to do, but we remain committed to countries like Ukraine and their stated goal to look more westward, and we'll do everything we can to make sure that they have the tools and resources to pursue that. Let me just say in conclusion as I close the hearing, this is a very a personal interest of mine. I am passionate about it. And perhaps I can have a round table where the people who are working on this issue could come and brief us, because I know many of us are concerned about this. So perhaps first you can do a memo for us, just giving us a better idea of exactly what you're doing, where you're doing, and then we can follow up with a discussion. But as I close this hearing, I want to thank the committee. I want to thank you for your time. This concludes today's hearing, and the Subcommittee on State Foreign Operations and Related Programs stands adjourned. And thank you so much for appearing before us.